Good morning. Let's talk about asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning. This is how my classes are now organized, and it is very different than a traditional classroom. That is definitely true. Yeah. Flippin' physics. Yep. There is a lot to describe in asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning, so let's start with flipped learning. Flipping students' learning basically means to move direct instruction or lecture out of the classroom to allow more time in class for more student-teacher interaction and more active learning. Put simply, the lectures are moved home and the homework is moved into the classroom. The locations of lectures and homework are flipped. If you want to know more about flipped learning, in the description of the video I have a link to my video which shows the differences between a traditional and a flipped classroom. Now let's talk about the gameful part. First, realize that school is already a game, and one of the hardest parts for students is learning what the rules of the game are. In my class, I lay out the rules of our game at the beginning of the year. The first rule is that everybody starts out with zero points. When a student looks at their grades in my class at the beginning of the year, they have a zero percent. It is weird. My parents were not happy. Yeah, but... Your grade never goes down in this class. I mean, no matter how badly you do on any assignment, as, as long as you get one point, your grade goes up. That is nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With regard to parents, I communicate very early in the school year with my parents about the class structure and that everyone has zero points at the beginning of the school year. That alleviates a lot of those concerns. So... Every assignment is based on points, not based on percentage, and every semester has a total number of points available. Everybody knows at the beginning of the semester how many points it takes to get what grade, and all you have to do is do enough assignments to get whatever grade you want. Actually, I will point out that at the beginning of the semester, I give the students access to a web page which lists every assignment for the semester. Some assignments are mandatory and some assignments are optional. All the assignments are listed in the order I recommend students do the assignments, and they are grouped by level. Each level is a general topic students need to learn. At the end of each level is a quiz. Another rule is that before you can take the quiz at the end of a level, you need to have done every mandatory assignment in that level. And another rule is that in order to pass each level, you need to pass that level's quiz. This is the gameful part of the class, right, Mr. P? Actually, Billy, it is both the gameful and mastery learning parts of the class. Gameful learning borrows from how quality games function and applies that to the design of the learning environment. Typically in a game, you start out with zero points, and as you move through the game, you earn points and progress through levels. The mastery learning part is that you have to demonstrate proficiency by passing a quiz to progress to the next level. If you do not pass the quiz, you have to at least do quiz corrections. You may also have to retake the quiz and possibly do more optional assignments. But the main point here is that you have to understand the material before you can progress to the next level. Which, from a learning standpoint, really makes sense you should have to demonstrate that you understand what you are learning before you can move on. That is mastery learning. It is kind of a pain, though. I actually think it's worse to just keep plowing through the material when you do not understand what you are doing. That's true. As a teacher, I can tell you that mastery learning has been really helpful for students' learning. And lastly, we have the asynchronous part. There are no due dates in my class. That, that's actually not true. Re remember the projectile motion build project had a specific due date. And the final exam has a due date. Okay, so there are a few assignments which have specific due dates because there are, for example, building schedule constraints, which I cannot change. And the class has to end by a certain date, so everything has to be due by the end of the semester. But what I really mean is that the vast majority of the assignments do not have due dates. I do give suggested completion dates. However, almost all assignments can be turned in whenever the student chooses to turn it in. This means the students are working asynchronously. 
The students have control over their own learning. They get to decide what they are doing each day, not me. That is another rule. And it means every class period has students working on many different assignments all at once. Okay, here is an example grading scale from one of my classes. You can see that the total number of points from mandatory assignments only gets you to 89.5% of the points. In order to get an A in my class, you need to do more than just the mandatory assignments. And realize there are 1,012 mandatory points, however, there are also more than 400 optional points. In other words, every semester, I have students who end up with more than 100% in the class. That's okay. They do much more than the mandatory minimum, and they get a grade that reflects that. Let's talk about quizzes for a moment, because this class structure completely changes the function of quizzes. Quizzes are no longer just an assessment tool. Because of quiz corrections, they are also a learning tool. Because of asynchronous learning, students get to decide when they are ready to take the quiz. And because if they do poorly, the only consequences are that they need to spend more time learning the material, there is a lot less stress associated with taking quizzes. It usually takes a few iterations for students to fully understand this. However, once they do, they are much less stressed about taking quizzes. Okay, class, have we covered the whole description? Asynchronous means the students work at their own pace and decide exactly which assignments to do and when to turn them in. Flipped means the lectures are done at home and the stuff that is normally done at home is now done in class. Gameful means the class is structured like a game where you gain points and pass levels. And mastery learning is that you have to show proficiency before moving on to the next level. So, yeah, we've covered the whole description. Great. Now, let's take a look at what this actually looks like. This is a time lapse of one of my classes. I will point out this class starts with the entire class working together to solve a few problems. Sometimes I do full class activities and even lectures for a couple of reasons. One reason is that students gave me feedback that they do actually want some in-class lectures and whole class group activities. Another reason is to provide students guideposts as to what they should have learned by this point in the semester. Now that the group activity is completed, students have begun working on whatever it is they feel they need to. You can see a large group of students are beginning to work on a lab, and I am giving them introductory instructions for that lab. And let's pause the video for a moment. You can see there are two groups of students who are collecting data for a lab. There are three groups of students who collected data on the lab during a previous class and are currently analyzing their data. I am currently helping a student who is completing a worksheet. We have two students who are working independently, and we also have two students who are each taking a quiz. You can see there is a sign on their table which indicates they are taking a quiz and they are not currently to be disturbed. And as you watch the class progress, you can see that the, that the majority of the class time has students working on whatever they feel they need to be working on today, and me, the teacher, bouncing around from table to table, answering questions and helping students out. Please notice how student-centered this type of class is rather than teacher-centered. And you can see that one group of students actually planned ahead because they would be missing class for a field trip and decided to take data for a second lab as well. They knew they can analyze the data outside of class, however, they cannot collect data outside of class. And now, class is over. It really is very different than my other classes. Yeah. Uh, agreed. That is why I communicate with administration and parents about how the class functions. It is a bit outside the norm, but traditional teaching has been around for a long time. We can do better. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you. Flippin' Physics. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Thomas Palmer, and I'm here to talk to you about the flipping physics journey into asynchronous flipped gameful mastery learning. And I just want to say 
Thank you to Dr. Mazur, Harvard, and the Physics of Living Systems Teacher Network for inviting me to give this talk. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to talk about what it is that I do in my classroom. I don't get many opportunities to do that, and I'm just excited to share with you about it and then to get questions from you and have a dialogue about this. I'm just, I'm just really excited. So let's get going. All right, before we get any farther into this, I just want to make sure you realize that you should have watched my Asynchronous Flipped Gameful Mastery Learning video. It's 10 minutes long, goes through and describes all of this stuff, and I'm not going to do that again right here. So please, if you have not watched this video, please make sure to follow the link and go, link, link, and go and make sure you watch it now. All right, let's just do a little background on me. Again, my name is Jonathan Thomas Palmer. This is my 21st year of being a high school physics teacher. In my 20 years, I have taught general physics, college prep physics, AP physics B, AP physics C mechanics, and AP physics C electricity and magnetism. I've taught a lot of different versions of physics. For my first 10 years as a high school physics teacher, I taught just like I was taught when I was a student. I gave lectures, and I gave more lectures. I did a lot of lectures, and honestly, I was really good at it. I really enjoyed giving lectures. I liked figuring out which students I could call on to get the correct answer. I liked following the incorrect answer to see where that would take us. I loved I loved that whole thing. I loved trying to time it so the class would end right at the bell. I was really good at lecturing. But I, I realized that there had to be a better way to do it. So I started searching for something different, just a different way of teaching. And I found the concept of flipped learning. And because of that, I filmed every lecture in every one of my classes for an entire school year, the 2011-2012 school year. And this is one of those videos. And as you can tell, it's not great quality. Please don't do this. It was way too much work and it's just not a great move. And I actually, these are the videos I used when I started flipping my classes in the fall of 2012. Not great, but it's what I did. And I've learned from that experience. My videos are much, much better now. Which brings us to the summer of 2013, when I left the classroom and founded Flipping Physics. The mission statement is, make the world a better place through real, fun, and free physics education. Um, and it was great. I really enjoyed it. But honestly, I missed my students. I missed the classroom. And there just is not much money in giving away all your content for free. So in January of 2015, I went back into the classroom part-time. I started teaching at a new school, and I was teaching what I'm going to call an AP Physics 1 level physics course. And we teach roughly 70% of the AP Physics 1 curriculum, but it's not an AP Physics course. Uh, and of course, it's a flipped classroom, of, of course. So, um, but again, I, I started searching for something different because I had read so many places that flipped learning transforms the classroom experience, but... I, I didn't see that happening. Like, yes, I, I changed where the lectures were done and where the homework was done, but it didn't, like, transform the classroom experience. And honestly, I was sick of telling my students what to do every day. I don't know what's going on in my students' lives. And every student has a different life, and they're not always ready for the quiz today or able to work on the lab today. Like, I was just sick of telling my students what to do. I wanted to give them autonomy. And I found this concept of gameful learning. The original flip of your classroom is typically called flipped learning 1.0. And when the, you then figure out how that's going to transform your classroom into something different is typically called in the flipped learning community flipped, flipped learning 2.0. So for me, that concept is gameful learning. And I learned a lot about gameful learning from this edX MOOC, this massive open online course from professors Barry Fishman and Rachel Niemer. Um, and I, I spent, I went through this entire course and I spent a full year, almost a full year, planning out and learning about gameful learning and figuring out how this was going to transform my class. And I do want to let you know that this course, unfortunately, has been archived. You can get to all the materials, but you can't actually take the course. So again, I just want to stress, I spent a full year planning about making the switch to gameful learning in my classroom. I started planning for the transition to gameful learning at the, in early 2017. And I will point out that I went to administration very early on in my research into gameful learning because I wanted to make sure that I had support from my administration. I wasn't going to spend all this time researching this and trying to figure out how to transform my classroom if, without support from my administration. So please make sure you get support from your administration. 
And I, I started asynchronous flipped gainful mastery learning in my classes in the beginning of second semester of 2018, so January of 2018. And the reason I, I, I have students for a full year, so these students I'd already had for a, one semester. And the reason I did that is because I knew, I, I know flipped learning is already a huge paradigm shift. And I knew switching to gameful learning was going to be difficult. And I knew I was going to make mistakes. And, and just, you know, I think teachers need to be willing to make mistakes. I think the students need to see teachers learning and they, they, the students need to see teachers taking risks. I mean, we just have, the students have to see that. Like, that's how they're going to be able to take risks is if they see you taking risks. And that, may, that means you're going to make mistakes sometimes. And, and I knew initially the class was not going to be as good as it was before I switched to gameful learning. Uh, however, I, I knew it would eventually be much better. And I got to tell you, I was right. So you have to be willing to make a big transition and admit to yourself, things are going to be, it's going to be hard. Things are not quite going to be as good as they were before, but eventually everything will be much better than it was before I made that change. Let's talk about some of those initial mistakes and corrections that I made. First off, uh, from the Gameful Learning MOOC, one of the things that they suggested was to give every level a fun name. So I named every level after a famous physicist. And it was a disaster. Students couldn't figure out what level they were, like what this level had to do with what was going on in the level. So now I just, every level is the name of the topic for the level. And it may not be as much fun, but it's a lot more user friendly. I also did not provide guideposts. So now the online gradebook has suggested due dates for all assignments. Every assignment, if you look in the, their gradebook, they can see this assignment is due by this particular date. And those are due dates. They're not actually due dates. They're su just suggested dates. So you know, if I'm on pace, I should have this assignment done by this particular date. And every level now has a suggested completion date. Another thing I did not do is I did not check in enough with the students about their plan. And to be honest, this is still a work in progress. I've tried Google feedback forms. I've tried individual conferences. I've tried requiring students to make a plan. Uh, and I'm not, still not happy with how it works. And um, it's just still a work in progress. It's better, but I'm still working on it. And I don't know why I didn't learn the first time. The first time when I flipped my classes, I did not lecture. And when I switched to gainful learning, I did not lecture again. And both times I got feedback from students saying, we really would like you to lecture. So now I do have some lectures which serve as guideposts for you should understand this material by this point. And another mistake I made was I did not provide current grade feedback. Honestly, the online gradebook that they have does not work well with gainful learning. So what I do now is I provide a current grade via weekly student gameful learning progress report, which I'm going to talk about now. So this item right here, I create in Excel every weekend and I post online. And I just find it funny because this I just harkens back to fall of 2000 when I started teaching and I learned that my school district didn't have any way to report to students what their grades were. So I created an entire web page, wrote it in HTML, and every weekend I would use Excel and I would post what their grades were online just like this. Uh, and the reason I have to do this is because, again, their gradebook just does not work well with gameful learning. So on the far right, you will see the 100% points. So you can see at the end of each week, I have identified how many points you should have in order to have 100% in the class. And you can see I've created a grading scale based on that for this particular week. And you can see the students then I've reported what their points are and what their percentage is at this point. So I like to think of this as a progress bar. On the right hand side, 100%, the points in the class progress as you go through the class. These are the number of points you should have in order to have a 100% in the class. And so as a student, if you have a percentage that's lower than 100%, you are behind where you should be in the class. And if you have more than 100%, you are ahead of where you should be in the class. So this is not like a typical grade, like in a normal class. This is just like a it's a progress report of where you currently are in the class. And it just gives students feedback of whether they're moving fast enough or if they're moving too slowly. 
People want to know, what is this actually like? Well, honestly, it's craziness. You saw the time-lapse video. The teacher is everywhere all at once, moving around. Students are moving around. And this just does not conform to normal teaching. It does not conform to normal teacher evaluations. You need to be aware of that. Like this whole idea that today we're working on X, Y, or Z, and I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to teach you this. It's just not just doesn't work. So if you want to know what's the goal for today, you need to talk to the, each student because they're all going to have a different goal for the day. They're going to have a different thing that they're working on. So it's just not normal. And I got to be honest, much of the teacher work is done before the semester even begins. Before the semester begins, you have to have all the assignments laid out. You need to know exactly what's going to happen during the entire semester so that everything is laid out. Now, I do make changes to the class as we go through, but really the whole skeleton is there. It's all set up already before the school year starts. Assignments are turned in when the student is ready. They don't turn in stuff if they don't understand it. So literally I have students show me their work before they turn it in and I give them feedback. And therefore they know when they turn it in that they understood the material. And because of this, grading is no longer like a breaking dam. It's not like, Look, I had a quiz in a lab due, so now I have pff, all this stuff I need to grade. Grading is like a constant flow rate. Every time I have class, I have stuff I need to grade. And it's just a constant. And it's much easier to deal with, honestly. It's just easier. And little thing, I no longer make paper copies of anything for students. We are now a one-to-one -one school district because of the pandemic. Every student has a Chromebook. I have a printer in my room, and when a student needs something, they print it out themselves. It's actually really awesome. <laughs> so don't tell anyone, but I don't make copies anymore. <laughs> okay, so this is so much more efficient with the student's time. They, there's never a time where they don't have something they could work on. They finish a quiz, they can work on the next thing. There's all, you know, you've got 15 minutes left in class, watch a couple videos. Like really, they can always have something that they're working on. And honestly, it's just easier for students to be absent or have some, something else going on in their lives because they can work on it here or there and they can decide exactly what they're going to work on. Uh, honestly, this shakes up lab groups. Because students are absent, like I was absent in my lab group that I normally work with, so I already worked, already did this lab, so now I'm here and I gotta work with this other person. And so at the beginning of class, often I will like help students figure out who's working on what, who needs to work on which lab, and it shakes up lab groups. Something I've been wanting to do for my entire career as a teacher, and this asynchronous flip gameful mastery learning creates different lab groups. And honestly, it is so atypical, it is refreshing. I hear this from students. It's just the, the way the classes run is just so different. It's just refreshing. Uh, and some of my students actually start class early and or leave late. So I have some students who will like arrive and like 10 minutes before class, they'll just start working on stuff and they'll start asking me questions because they, they recognize that this is no longer like me deciding now we're going to start working on stuff. They're the ones who are in charge of their own learning. And I, and I have a student who actually doesn't have a class for the class after their class. So rather than like picking up and leaving right at the end of the class, they just stay and finish what they're working on. And then 10, 15 minutes later, they end up leaving. It's just awesome. And it is so much easier to make up assignments when students are absent because of the way the class is structured. And I will tell you, beginning this year, I am now running a concurrent AP Physics C mechanics option in my class. I have some of my students, the majority of my students who are working on the algebra-based physics class that we normally have, and I've layered on top of that the option to add calculus-based physics. So I have some students who are concurrently doing both the algebra and adding on the calculus-based AP Physics C mechanics option. And I got to tell you, I don't know how I would be able to do it without asynchronous slip gameful mastery learning to be able to run those concurrently in the same classroom. But it is awesome. Let's get into some of the specifics points. Each semester has roughly six levels. Every level has optional practice problems worth one point each. Each level has between five and 30 practice problems, and you must do at least 10 practice problems to submit the for, submit for a grade, or if there are fewer than 10, you have to do all of them. And remember, these are optional practice problems. The students do not have to do them. And I provide my solutions to all practice problems. Every level has one mandatory and one optional worksheet, each worth six points. And again, I provide my solutions to all worksheets. 
Every level has an optional practice quiz worth six points. I provide my solutions to all practice quizzes. Every level has a culminating mandatory quiz worth 25 points. And no, I do not provide my solutions to quizzes. Almost every level has at least one mandatory lab worth 15 to 55 points. Most of my labs are actually in the 45 to 55 point range and require most of a 100 minute class to collect data. And my labs require students to use either Excel or Google Sheets to analyze and interpret data. And no, I do not provide solutions for my labs. Uh, some of my levels actually also have an optional lab worth between 15 and 30 points. And each semester has a large group project worth 90 points. And yes, I wish I had my students do more labs and more projects. I think that's true of every physics teacher, uh, but there's just room for me to grow and learn. Quizzes. A quiz score of at least 80% is required to pass each level. If a student gets less, less than 80%, they must do quiz corrections. They gain a half a point back for every point they lost when they do quiz corrections. And if you have at least 80% after having done quiz corrections, then the student passes the level. So notice 60 to 80% passes with quiz corrections. If a student gets, well, gets less than 60%, they get to do a quiz retake, they also do quiz corrections, and their final quiz grade is an average of the quiz scores. So every quiz becomes a learning experience. Think about that. If you get 80% or more, you've illustrated that you understand the material, you can move on. If you get less than 80%, you have to do quiz corrections and you have to illustrate that you understand the material before you move on, which is awesome. And this makes quizzes less scary because if they do poorly on the quiz, that just means that they then have to sit down with me and work on quiz corrections and make sure they understand the material. It does not negatively impact their grade. It just means that they don't understand the material yet, but they will before they move on. And I can't stress this, stress this enough. Students take quizzes when they think they are ready to take the quiz. It's huge. Cheating. I abhor cheating. Let's talk about it. Uh, most of the student work is done in the class, which mitigates cheating. Think about it. If all, if most of the work that the students do is actually in the class with the teacher wandering around, it just mitigates cheating. I encourage working as a group on every assignment with the exception of quizzes and final exams. They know the difference between working together and copying another student's work. So, and I also, we spend time talking about it and making sure that they do understand that. And I will tell you, I train them to teach one another. When I've answered one question from one student and another student comes up and asks them the same question, I bring that student over to the other one and I say, hey, I already answered this question for you. Could you help this other student understand the answer to this question? And I stay there and I help them work their way through teaching one another. And I do this over and over again during the, during the school year. I help them teach one another. And as we get farther and farther into the school year, they start to do it on their own without my prodding. And it is awesome. And it mitigates cheating. I have at least five different versions of every quiz, not just changing the numbers, different problems, and just mitigates cheating. They cover the same topics, but it mitigates cheating. So, and, and by making quizzes more of a learning tool and less scary, students are less compelled to cheat. I mean, really, it's just the quizzes are not as stressful, so they aren't as compelled to cheat. Also, I provide solutions for everything except labs, quizzes, and final exams, which means they know that they understand the material or don't understand the material. And if they don't understand the material, they spend more time learning it before they take the quiz. And students cannot pass each level until they understand the material, until they've illustrated on a quiz that they understand the material. And they learn early on that copying the material does not actually help them learn because sometimes I do get students who copy my solutions and I can tell, and then they take the quiz and they do not do well. And we have a conversation about it and they learn that they actually need to learn the material. Thank you for watching. I, I know I shoved a lot at you. Please sign up for the live Zoom question and answer session because I know you have questions. It's on Saturday, November 20 from 11 a.m. to noon Eastern Standard Time. The links, I'm sure, are someplace obvious. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you. In case. And with that, all right. I think there are enough of us logged on to get started.
So today, uh, it is my absolute pr pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jonathan. Um, so as you all know, Jonathan is the creator of Flipping Physics. He has over 20 years of experience in the classroom, and he is going to be answering your questions today. Um, so I do want to um, remind you to raise your hand. If you've asked a question on perusal, feel free and repeat it here uh, since not everybody may have watched the video, although I'm sure everybody who's here did. Um, and with that being said, welcome, Jonathan. Uh, it's so exciting to have you here. Um, what would you like us to call you, Mr. P? Uh, I know you have <laughs> a lot of names online, so. Let's just go with Jonathan. 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 All right. Well, welcome. Welcome. We are so excited to have you. Um, and let's see. So with that, I have questions of my own, but I think I want to hold back until um, the discussion is, is getting started. So if you could raise your hand and, and ask a question. If not, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question myself, but I'd rather not because I might just monopolize the time a little bit. El Marie, go ahead. Uh, hi, and welcome. Uh, I want to say hi from Winter Park, Florida here. Um, so Jonathan, my first question, well, before I ask the question, just a, a quick comment. When my students heard that I was gonna today listen to somebody that does flipping physics, they all went, wow, tell him he's our hero. Um, one of the students said, if it wasn't for you, he was not going to be able to pass the AP Physics exam, uh, AP Physics 1 exam last year. So thank you, thank you, thank you from all of us for what you do. Um, so last year when the pandemic hit, and it was clear that we all had to sort of start inventing something new, I tried to make a video. And I absolutely, it was absolute disaster. I, never in my life will I try that again. Um, so... I started borrowing from your videos. Um, how do you, what is your place? Where do you see your place in helping other physics students, uh, physics teachers make their classes um, more accessible and, and better for the students? Okay, so first off, uh, you are absolutely welcome. Um, I think it's awesome that your students enjoy my videos, that's awesome, and can learn from them. So what I will tell you is that the whole reason I make my videos is based on the idea that I am giving them to all of you to use to be able to better flip your classes. Uh, back in 2013, when I first started doing this, I recognized that one of the most difficult parts of a flipped classroom is creating the videos. Um, and that I happen to have a particular skill in that area. And so I decided to just make a whole bunch of videos that you can use. I mean, really, that's the whole reason I make them. Uh, and, and what I find interesting is that I've actually heard back from teachers now, which I'm amazed at, that like teachers are using them as well to like help themselves learn the physics better. Um, and have taken my videos like this is the first time this year is the first time that I realized that uh, I have a video where we drop a ball outside of a moving car and you can predict where it's going to land and have it land in a bucket. This is the first year I realized that like I made that video and other teachers have taken that idea and are also doing that, which I, I which is just amazing. I like I don't know. I when I first started doing this, I, I never really imagined that people would actually watch them. I mean, it's just me in my basement. I'm, I'm right here right now. I'm in front of the whiteboard and like, I just write videos and I make them. And it, it, it's so weird because it feels very isolated uh, because I, I, I make them by myself. I, you know, I play all four characters. I do all the editing. I do, I do everything. And like, and then I post them and then I make the next video. I don't know. It, it's a, it's a very strange experience. I hope that I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Elmarie. So if if I may make a comment, Jonathan, one of the things that really stood out to me about your whole presentation was how you highlighted 
your process in, in the talk that we posted on perusal. So you talked about the videos and you gave us an example of like your earlier recordings of you in the classroom, right? And there is quite a big difference between that versus what we see today. Yeah. Um, so I guess my follow-up is, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about knowing that what you're doing is not the best it could be in the classroom and being okay with trying things out and learning in front of your students. Could you say more about that? Because it's something we've talked about before and really just like this messaging of being wrong is okay. Not getting things right is okay. You know, can, can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, this is actually something that I work against a lot and have for 20 years, this idea that it's not okay to be wrong. Um, and that like, like I, and I, it, I don't know where it comes from, but a lot of my students have this idea that it's, it's not okay to be wrong. And that makes it so that they don't risk anything. And, and like, you, you don't learn if you're not wrong. Um, and one of the things that I, I force my students to do from day one is use a pencil. And I know that sounds silly, like that that's actually an important thing, but like, I stress that the reason you have to use a pencil is because you are going to be wrong so often that you are going to have to erase. Um, and it, and, and I, I try to stress that. And I, I always tell my students as well, a, a story from my first year of teaching when I gave a midterm and I gave a midterm to which there was no correct answer to a problem. I gave, actually, this is a physics group, so I can tell you, it was a projectile motion problem where the question was, where does this projectile la land on the wall? And it never made it to the wall. It landed on the ground in front of the wall, according to the problem. Um, and I, I think it's just important to recognize that we can always do better. And part of doing better is making mistakes because you you learn from those mistakes. And I learned a lot from that mistake. I have never given a quiz or anything that I didn't fully work out beforehand again. Um, and it, it's it's something I stress in my teaching. I mean, I mean, I've switched from flipped learning to asynchronous flipped gainful mastery learning. And I told my students when I did that, that this is going to be a challenge for all of us but in the end, you are going to learn more and I am going to learn more from this experience. And I, I talked about a bunch of the mistakes that I, I made in there. Uh, and I do think that the way my class is organized also makes it so students can make mistakes um, and challenge themselves. It, like, I, I'll just give an example. I just had a student who's one of my, you know, you have some students who are just really good and they took a quiz and they got a 50% on that quiz. And like in a normal situation, that's going to just be very difficult as a student. But I sat down with that student and I was like, okay, let's just figure out what you made, where your mistakes were. And it was, the truth was, it was a couple of little mistakes. And those little mistakes made it so that there was a freak out moment, which you know, everybody does, it happens on these quizzes. But I was able to talk our way through it. And in the end, they got, you know, they they got ended up getting because you get half back with a, whatever, and then you retake the, the quiz. And I think they got ended up with a B on that quiz, which was absolutely fine and had zero effect on their grade in the long run. Excellent. And, and I could talk forever. So I'm like, like, I will stop and try to make it so that we can ask more questions. <laughs> All right. So I'm a teacher. I can talk forever. This is great. Well, you're in a room full of teachers, so we have people in line like <laughs> excited to ask you questions. I do okay, want to okay. jump in from the chat and say that, you know, you mentioned uh, pencils. So students can erase because there's going to be a lot of mistakes. We have um, some alternatives. So uh, we have people in the chat talking about whiteboards, how it encourages the same thing. We have Philip Blanco, who shared that they actually forbid pencil for the same reason. Okay. They okay. I, can. Okay. So can I hear why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they explain it in there. Um, Philip, would you, would you feel comfortable jumping in? Sorry, I put you on the spot. That's okay. I, I'm sorry. I don't have video. It's just an old computer. Um, 
No, I, I say no pencils. Uh, this is I teach community college, so uh, might be different. But I say no pencils. That's for that's for kindergarten. Um, if you make a mistake, just put a line through it. Um, if you want to, put the reason for your mistake next to it and carry on. And I tell them I'm not going to grade, not grading for neatness. I don't want you to write some beautiful work of art. I want to see the mistakes in there. I want you to acknowledge them and then move on from there. And that's how we learn. That's how we learn science. But it does take a while to deprogram them from this idea that they have to be perfect and right the first time. So I'm doing this for the same reason that you are. I'm just approaching it in a different way. I, and I got to say, I have two things to say to that. Number one, I love it. I think it's a great idea. I'm going to let it percolate. This is how ideas work. It's going to percolate in my brain and see that because that I can totally see doing that. Um, because I do have an issue where students erase too much. They think they've made a mistake and they're like, I'm going to erase everything. And then like that is awful uh, because you can't like you. There's a lot of learning to see from the mistake that you made. The other thing that I want to say is thank you for saying that because I just I think it's important to recognize that I'm just a physics teacher. I've been teaching for 20 years. And yes, I have this online presence and all this stuff. So you all know me, but that doesn't mean that like what I'm saying is right. Right. So recognize that you you have every right to challenge what I'm saying. And I don't expect you all to like walk away from here being asynchronous, flipped, gameful, mastery, learning um, aficionados or, or planning to definitely do it or, or whatever. So just realize that it, I'm just giving advice and I love hearing that advice from you. Uh, Scott, you've been waiting patiently. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Scott. Hey, um, I will, I, you confirmed my, one of my questions. That is you. That's all you. That you're, you're, the th you're your three students and your teacher. I thought I, I suspected as much. And I was wondering why you do that. And if you said a necessity and how you do that, it must take a lot of time. And um, finally, uh, did you see this work? Have you seen improved results on your students' AP tests? Okay, I feel like there were a lot of questions in there. Um, okay, uh, I got distracted. Okay, so let's start with the why, I guess. Uh, so the why actually goes back to the first time I made a video with Billy Bobby and Bo in it was 2003. And I was, I actually knew that I was going to be gone from school because my daughter was having surgery. She's doing fine. She was anyway, two years old. Anyway, um, I knew I was going to be gone for a couple of days and I, I abhor missing school. So I actually made a video of myself teaching that my students watched in class while I was absent. And I find it really humorous that the genesis of this whole thing was completely flipped from the way this works. And when I made that video, I was going to be lecturing and I didn't wanna just lecture to no one. So I just reached into my closet and I grabbed a tie dye, a tie and a Steelers jersey. And I was like, these are my three characters, Billy, Bobby and Bo, go for it. Uh, and what I found through time of doing this is the having these three characters, which my students identify as separate people, even though they fully recognize that I am all of them. Uh, like it makes it so that I can get things wrong in the videos, like, and there can be questions asked in the videos and things are also repeated in different ways and mm -hmm. you see different perspectives. So like I have found Billy Bobby and Bo as a really wonderful tool to make it so that I can address a lot of misconceptions and make mistakes and talk about all those things. And I, I actually fully enjoy, I have background stories for all of them anyway, but like, <laughs> like I, I enjoy the whole lore of the, the physics thing. So I'll, uh, the flipping physics, Billy, Bobby, and Bo. So I will, we'll do a little behind the scenes here. Um, I will show you, cause you asked how this works, how I do mm -hmm. it. Uh, so I, I edited in Final Cut Pro. Give it a moment. Sorry, that's my wife and daughter. We have my random background screen there. Uh, oh, taking a while to load. Okay, so in Final Cut Pro, uh, I will show you exactly how I do this. I guess I should have had it loaded beforehand. All right, so uh, let's do, so you get to see how the sausage is made. All right, so this is one of my videos that I uh, just finished. And you can see, right, we've got, um, okay, so you could see here 
we've got all of this is the the video itself and these this is the timeline of all the different things this is some audio this is the text so on and so forth but if we dive into here which is a grouped uh clip you could see this is where billy and bobby billy bobby and bo are so what i do is i film them separately so i film billy by himself i film bo by himself and then i film bobby by himself and then i layer them over one another you must have a script oh i have oh and so that's an important question so everything that i do is very scripted so this is important to realize so i've had student or i've had teachers who are like i want to do what you do so realize that my process involves first off 20 years of teaching physics so that I have the background to know what I'm doing. Then I figure out what video I'm going to do. I write lecture notes. Then I write a, well, actually, then I do a demonst I do a demonstration. Then I write the lecture notes. Then I write a script. Then I post a script to a quality control group of physics teachers who read through the script and uh, give me feedback and find mistakes. Then I film it. Then I edit it. Then I post it back to my quality control team and they look over it again and sometimes find mistakes and make mis make suggestions. Like this is a whole very scripted process. I, I estimate it takes me roughly two hours for every one minute of video that I make. Oh, wow. Wow. And I of course have a time-lapse video where I show all that entire process in case you're curious. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this isn't something that's easy for you all to do. And, and <laughs> I will point out that I, I did this for five years before I had anybody else help me do with the quality control. Anyway. Sorry. Oh, and then, oh, sorry. And then there was one more question. So have I seen improvement mm. in my grades? So the difficult part of that is that I have switched schools and there's been a pandemic and I have switched classes that I teach. So I cannot do an apples to apples, like real comparison. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I just can't. Uh, I can tell you from conversations with my students that I know they understand the material better. And just the whole idea that they can't move on without understanding it from one topic to the next, like, like is, is groundbreaking. Cause it used to be that I would just like, for my first 10 years of teaching, I would just plow through everything. And it was like, yeah, I know you got a 40% on that quiz, but we got to move on. <laughs> we do. We gotta right. Go. Yeah. And, and I, uh, I hated it and I'm so much happier now. I'll stop. I think I answered your question. You did. That's awesome. Thanks. Cool. All right. Joseph Bellina, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was uh, interested in the pencil pen question also. Uh, <laughs> have, have you thought about having students keep an intellectual notebook where basically every work, all the work they do, all the problems they solve, everything is in that notebook and they never erase anything. Essentially you treat, working solving problems and thinking about things in the same way that you would handle a lab notebook so nothing is ever erased it's crossed out it's annotated you can always go back to it at some time in the future and look at what you did and how you thought and how your thinking has changed i i will tell you honestly the answer is your your question was have i thought about it yeah my answer is no <laughs> However, my answer is also, I am now thinking about it because I, like, I love this idea. Uh, and I'm actually combining it with, I have three students who have iPads and they use an Apple pencil and they, I, everything that I give to them, I give in a, in a PDF form. So they actually just import the PDFs onto their iPads and they use these, these pencils and like, they have everything right there. And mm -hmm. it is awesome and i i love the idea i think that it's prohibitively expensive um but i i, I love your idea i i mean, we could I, do it on paper too i mean true, you know. true i i understand that but like like uh having it on the ipad makes it so that like they can take my paper and then just they write on the paper like right. i have students who right. so i have my students always take lecture notes and i have some students who the, these students who take the PDF of my lecture notes and they just write all over my lecture notes as their lecture notes, which is yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just awesome. Now, the other thing I wondered, 
was uh, you have a certain zany persona in the in the videos, and and uh, because of the characters and everything, have you had a problem with students taking you seriously in the classroom? <laughs> Uh, I am I am a different teacher than I am flipping physics. Uh, I am a very serious teacher. Um, I have very high expectations, but I also, well, I also have fun. But like, like, no is my answer. And they can handle that transition for you. I mean, that you're. Yeah, I think there's a. I think there's a certain like that is separate from the classroom. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I like it's kind of the same thing. Like I used to be a, a camp counselor and every once in a while I'd run, 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 run into one of my campers and they would be like, what, why aren't you at camp? Right. Like like in your brain, I like I am slightly separate from the flipping physics. Uh, yeah. I don't know. That, the last question is, what's the what, what's the demog the uh uh, what your what do your classes look like in terms are they uh all white are they mixed uh, uh, uh so i have class, um, upper class lower class so i teach at a school which is uh there are no tracked classes in my school so there are zero prerequisites for my physics class so when it comes to math background my students run from struggling with algebra to I have a student who's taking third semester calculus at our local university right now. Um, and I have students of all sorts of different backgrounds. However, because my class is an elective, which means it is like there are in Michigan, the state of Michigan, there are three years of science that are required. And mine actually then is the fourth. Mm -hmm. So there is no one who has to take my class. And because of that, my class is actually populated with more white students and more uh, socioeconomically advantaged students. Um, and this is something that I struggle with. Um, I, for a long, for when I first started teaching, I really had a large issue with gender where it was mostly male. And I it feel like in my school district, that is, we're, we're at roughly 50% now in my classes and have been for a few years. Um, but like, this is this is a known issue and, and something that I, I personally, like I am trying, but the, one of the reasons I make everything free is because I want this to be available to anyone, to any teacher, regardless. And I will say, and I'm just going to say this because I, I feel like I have to, I am, I give up 60% of a teacher's salary in order to make these videos. I am only 40% of a full-time teacher, uh, which means that I make 40% of a full-time teacher's salary. And if you think YouTube advertisements pay a lot of money, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> and so I have, I, I'm just going to say it. I have a Patreon. And if you are able to, I would love it if you could donate monthly, even a, even a little bit. Uh, there's On my website, there's a give button right at the top. You can click on that. So I had, had to say it because I have, okay. I'm going to have two kids in college in a little bit here. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think your, I, I think your dedication is fantastic, you know, and I, and, and uh, I applaud you for it. Thank you. Uh, I actually love what I do. I like, like I, I treat every video basically as a puzzle. I like, I love to try to figure out what's the best way to present this. And like, sure, I did it this way in class, but now I have these cameras and all this, these characters and all this stuff. And I love, I love, and the slow motion video, I love being able to take and slow things down and talk about how they work. Anyway, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Great question. So I, I will say before I turn things over to Crestan that, uh, Jonathan, I think your videos, there have been like a couple where, I mean, it might be the only physics content where I'm smiling from beginning to end. <laughs> so um, 
in terms of making it fun. Really, I, I will tell you, I don't know. I don't know what is fun or funny for other people. So I only make it to entertain myself and hope that other people will be entertained. That's that's it. <laughs> and I'm glad someone, I'm glad someone else is entertained. <laughs> Chris, Nan, please go ahead. Yeah, just wanted to ask. Uh, so I think that's great. Um, Two questions. I know this is your intellectual property and, and of course uh, it belongs to you, but if you're interested, uh, what would it take for to streamline this, this whole process so that if some other teacher wants to do the same, uh, they can do it? Is it possible for you to somehow um, streamline it in a, in a way of here is what you need, here is how you do it, uh, and, and perhaps help even? And I mean, of course, you should be rewarded for that. <laughs> uh, so to understand your question, what you're asking is, could I take what I do, the, my process, and find a way to make it so that other teachers could do something similar? That's what I mean. Um, I, this is something that's, that's wandered around in my brain for years. Um, and if I won the lottery and had a lot of money, like I could start something like that. It, it, the problem I think is that what I do takes a lot of technical expertise uh, that I've been developing for 20 years. Uh, I think it might be possible to do some sort of pared down version. And I'm not sure necessarily recreating the Billy Bobby and Bo thing is all that all that important. I find it fun for myself, but I don't think it's all that important. Um, but I, I really think it's the the demonstrations and the clarity of the concepts being shown and all the equate like showing every single step in the equations that I, that I think is the important part. Um, but I, I don't currently have the money or the time to be able to do something like that. Well, I mean, we, we could fund something like that through NSF, I mean, if, uh, I mean, this, if there is big interest in the teachers community, uh, I don't think the money are the problem. The question yeah. is how do you streamline it so that somebody without your 20 years and technical expertise can do it? Yeah, one of, the, one of the problems is we have these, we have these cameras, so we all think that we're really good with the cameras um, and we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I love the idea. I don't know. I, I don't know is my answer, okay. sadly. <laughs> good, good question. Uh, Jolene Johnson, go ahead. Hi. So first of all, I love the videos like everyone else. Um, Thanks. And students have found them helpful. I'm trying to teach AP physics and regular physics in the same classroom. So this whole idea of flipping it is helpful. Also, it's all online. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that I'm running into, so I tend to teach in schools because I choose this, uh, where I don't have any white males. I have no white males in my classroom. It is 100% minority and more females than males. And I'm just wondering, um, I know, I mean, I know it's all you and you're doing all this work, but it, it, the thing that kind of, I always am like, oh, I don't know, is that you have three stereotype white male physics students. And when I have no white male <laughs> physics students in my classroom, I'm like, I don't know if I'm sending them this message or like this is who does physics or if they can't see themselves. And then just because I don't want to have to turn my video back on with screaming kids. But I have one other question, too. Um, and that's just how do you handle a district where homework is not really a thing, but we still have to stick to the AP schedule. So like, right, you can't you don't have enough time in and out of class. I'm just wondering how you handle that, if you have that problem or not. Oh, sorry, before you go. So uh, the the second part of the question, uh, sorry, I lost the first part. <laughs> sorry, the second part of the question was, um, how do you handle not being able to give homework? Is that your question? Yeah, Basically. so like the district thing is for equity reasons, we shouldn't have homework because okay. kids have busy lives, but then okay. Okay. sticking to AP and if you're flipping it and nothing's at home. Like, okay, right, I got the first yeah. part of the question. Okay, okay, I think I got it. Okay, um, right, so I am a white male. Uh, and the problem is, is that I duplicate myself three times and I have had on more than one occasion, someone make a comment that's like, they need to hire a more diverse cast, which 
I can't because I don't hire anyone because I don't have the money. Um, I did on one occasion get three students from our local university to come and play three students and do that. Uh, it was extremely difficult to get to work, get to get that to work. I had, I sent out a lot of communications asking people if they'd like to come to my basement and be in my videos. And that did not go over well. Like people just did not respond well to that. Uh, and so it was a lot of work. And I got to tell you, the reception was not overly positive because it was, I think because it was just a change from Billy, Bobby and Bo and they all have their characters. Um, and to go back to the question that Krasnan had, I think like if we could make this something like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could make this so that like we write the scripts and then we have teachers who play various parts and we could have diversity in the teachers and in the characters and all that stuff. Like that would be wonderful. I don't, I don't know if we can get there and I don't have a solution to the fact that I'm a white male and that I, I make the videos. And I, I wish I did. Right you now. shouldn't invite them to your basement. You should invite them to the lower part of your house. Fair enough. Okay, okay, right. Good, good point. Uh, so the other part with the homework, um, I do, well, well, first off, just flipping your classes decreases the amount of homework in general. And what I've, I've had some people do is to do what is called an internal flip. So student, you have a few devices in your classroom and students come in and they watch the videos in class. And so that just makes time more efficient for your students and so that they have just more time available. And I think that's really the key is to try to figure out how to be most efficient with your students' time so that you can get through, they can understand as much of the AP material as possible. And I think that's my biggest suggestion to you is if you can find a way to have them do the videos in class, and then you can pare down the number of videos that they have to do. Um, that's, I think, my suggestion. Rob, go ahead. Hey, so uh, a couple of things that were said had me thinking. Um, Good. between what you said and Kristan said and um, several other people. And I was wondering if you ever had the thought or the inclination um, to do videos on physics teaching for teachers, right? So a conversation that we often have in this group and kind of the core group is, you know, first, a lot of physics teachers are the only physics teacher. And second, a lot of them are new and hitting that point of like, cool, you're alone, you don't know what to do, you know, who do you turn to to kind of get that, one, the mentorship, but two, also like, am I even doing this lab right? Am I even doing this demo right? Is this explanation even right? Um, you know, is that something, you know, I know you said that you just recently found that out. One, is that something you've ever thought of or something you're, you know, interested in pursuing? So can you clarify, what, what are you asking if I'm interested in pursuing? So in, <laughs> sorry, my dog is very interested too. No, in okay. pursuing and creating. Ah, right, right, right. Okay, so, uh, so, okay. So am I interested in pursuing creating videos to help teachers, physics teachers specifically learn how to teach physics? Yeah, or if okay. it's, you know, something you kind of ever considered. Okay. Um, Oh, okay. You know, so I know it's a byproduct of what you've done. Is it something now that maybe you're interested in? Okay. So what's an interesting thing about that is uh, the, the audacity that I think that I could make physics videos to teach physics teachers how to teach physics is, is astounding. Um, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, I have had physics teachers learn physics from my videos, right? I did a while back do a video about six different teachers, physics teachers approaches to labs. Uh, and I did, that did not get a whole lot of traction. 
Uh, and the, the answer is, I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think that there's no way that I should do that by myself, right? If that was something that I would do, that is something that I would work with other physics teachers on. And I think it's a wonderful idea. And I only have so much time in my life. Uh, those are my various answers. And it, like, if I could, no, well, gosh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So there's, there, I love the ideas. These are great ideas. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Deb Williams, go ahead. Hey, Jonathan, how are you doing? I am well. Very nice to meet you. You uh, you've saved my life this year because I only found out I was teaching AP physics a week before school started. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I'm I, I teach AP bio. I teach AP chemistry also. So what's you know what's one more AP class? Right. So, but um, I have been having my kids as part of their test corrections making videos like yours where okay. they have to have their own like Billy Bo and Bobby explanation. I'll assign a problem to a certain group and a different problem to a different group. And they end up making these little short videos explaining how to solve. And um, they share with each other and it's been extremely valuable. So <laughs> thank you for that model. It's been fantastic. Cool. That, that, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks so much, Deb. Uh, Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, it's me again. Uh, I just was wondering, you're in Ann Arbor, right? Yeah, I think. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Have you, have you explored at all the possibility of getting essentially free workers from the audiovisual students at the University of Michigan? Uh, I haven't I haven't done that. I the, the way I found my students to be Billy Bobby and Bo sir, uh, step ins was through the University of Michigan. I've met with a University of Michigan physics professor talking about the concept of physics videos, and we didn't find a whole lot of overlap. I've never really thought about like the getting audiovisual help. I, I think one of the issues that I've run into. I'll, I'll rephrase that. One of the things that I really like about the fact that I'm the one who does, does all the editing and animating and all of the visuals is that like literally when I'm looking at a visual, I am thinking about all the physics behind that visual. And it may not even be a part of this particular video, but I make sure that like the, the free body diagram all the vectors are the right length and that in the Doppler effects, like that the, all of the wave fronts emanate, continue to emanate from the location that they came from. Like, like there are so many little important things that when I animate, I feel like having a, a really deep knowledge of physics is really helpful. So I, I struggle with the idea of farming out some of my work. Yeah. What I'm thinking about is, um, you might save yourself some time and you might be able to get some money out of it. Time and money. Or money to support what you're doing, you know, through the university. Yeah. And uh, I, I have, I will tell you, I've tried to find all sorts of different places to get grants or whatever. And nobody wants to give a grant to a guy who's just a high school physics teacher who makes videos. Yeah. I, I, I can't, I have not been able to find it. I got one grant once for a thousand dollars in 2014. The awesome foundation. That's great. <laughs> I have, I have um, a question kind of pivoting the conversation slightly. So we've been talking about creating resources for teachers to learn how to teach uh, the video editing and resourcing and partnerships. And I think that's all great, but I, I kind of want to take it back into the classroom and this is inspired by a couple of questions, at least two, maybe maybe a few more that I saw on perusal. And these had to do with the topic of classroom management. So questions along the lines of, you know, do you ever have students who are not working on physics? Oh, no, no, never okay. happens. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> no, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm inherently sarcastic, so I, I'm sorry. go ahead. Um, that, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, how yeah. do students 
use time in your classroom? And do you, how do you make sure that students are working on physics when they're in the classroom where so much is going on and right. students are working asynchronously? Right, 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 right. Okay, so let's talk about the reality of what happens in the classroom. So the reality is that I have students who have lives and they have, um, for example, college, this is where the college application season, right? So November 1st, all the college applications were due. Uh, I have a series of students who are in the play, which is going on this weekend. And that for the last week and a half, they've been in tech rehearsals and, and, and all that stuff. Um, so how do I make sure students are always working on physics in my class? I, I was going to say I don't, and that's not quite right. I almost never ha allow a student to work on something that's not for my class in my class. Uh, I think it's important to know your students and know who they are and what's going on in their lives. And just the way I have my class structured means that I have more time to actually talk with my students. So I do my best to try to connect with every student every day. I don't, it's a pie in the sky idea, but I get pretty close. Um, and I do, I run into the student who I come over and they're playing Clash of Clans. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I have a conversation about how the company that made this game is making it so that you are addicted to this game, like literally. They force you to update it every, if, if you don't touch that, anyway, I, we have this conversation and then we, I say, you, but this is not okay for here, okay? Uh, Wednesday of this week, I came over to a student and I started talking to her and she was studying for an interview for a school that was happening later that day. And there were 15 minutes in class and I just decided that this student, I wasn't going to force, I, I knew this student was doing fine in my class, right? So that's, that's something you always have to have in the back of your mind as well. You gotta keep track of who's, who's on pace, who's ahead, who's behind. This student I knew was on pace and I knew was stressed about this, this interview they were going to have. So I had a five minute conversation with this student about the interview where they were going to have. And I asked them test questions about the interview. And like, the reality is if you, are not aware of what's going on in your students' lives and you are always like, you have to do this today, you're not, you're not gonna be able to, you're, you're not gonna have your students on your side, right? Um, but like I, that same day, I had a student who was, start, was working on a different assignment for a different class that was due later that day. And I was like, I'm sorry, you, you are, four weeks behind in my class. This is not okay. Okay. We we've got to have this conversation. I know you need to do quiz corrections. Let's get those out. Okay. Um, I think I answered the question. Did I answer? Sorry. I get, I get lost. Sometimes I get excited and I forget what <laughs> the question was. You did. Thank you. Uh, Philip, Philip Blanco. Yes. Hello again, again, sorry, no camera. Um, but Jonathan, um, I think uh, Galilei and Newton would be proud of what you're doing. And um, even though I'm not a, a rich patron like they had, I'll definitely be going on to Patreon later to uh, help you out. Um, I'm just curious why you chose three students and if this, this has anything to do with Galileo's dialogue on the two chief world systems where he also has three characters. I know why you don't have four because it's a lot of extra work, but even having three students instead of two is a lot of extra work for you. So why three? I will tell you, it's just the number that I ended up with. It fits well on the screen. Uh, I, I really have no good reason for it. I, I, I think like, so, so when I think about the three characters, they, they are all me. They're just taking me and exaggerating some of my personalities. So like, like when I think about the three personalities that are Billy, Bobby and Bo, it's really just exaggerations of me. And so, I mean, that, that's where they come from, but I, I, don't, I don't have a reason for three. I think it works incredibly well, because if it was two characters and they disagree, they might be butting heads. But if there's three, then it breaks the tie. Um, and I think I heard somewhere in education research that three is the 
best number for a group, a lab group to be doing something. So uh, yeah, it fits on the screen, but it also works very well pedagogically. Perfect. See, that's what I, that was my plan. Uh, John had a question, and I think it would benefit all of us to hear your answer. Um, you're so generous uh, making these resources and providing these videos um, for the physics education community to use. What resources do you use? Are, are, are there resources people you follow or that you use sometimes in your, your classroom um, that we should know about? Okay. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Dr. Mazur. Uh, who, <laughs> who published a book called Peer Instruction, uh, which I got maybe 17 years ago. And I love the peer instruction concept. And that's something I continue to use in my class uh, often. So that, that's, and I, I actually stick with the, the sheets of paper because I love the tactile, just sheets of paper. Anyway, uh, so you should definitely need to check out peer instruction. Uh, one of the best resources I have found is I'm in three actually physics Facebook private physics teacher Facebook groups, um, and you you could Google or search on Facebook for which one fits best for you. Uh, and I I wish that this had been around when I was first teaching because when I was first teaching uh, somebody talked about it like I was basically alone. And I didn't know if what I was doing was correct. And uh, I love that we have this resource now. I mean, there are thousands of teachers in these Facebook groups and people get uh, the, like, there are resources shared there. People ask questions, uh, people get their, I mean, I, I, I just wish like when I'd been first teaching, when I was struggling with one problem, like I, I could post it and I could get the, an answer because I mean, it's so helpful. I, that That's the biggest one for me is the private physics teacher Facebook groups. That's my biggest suggestion for you. Yeah, that reminds me of Robert's uh, question and comment about teacher isolation um, and how, you know, in my own experience, I have also found several, several of these platforms to be um, just incredibly, an incredible resource. Um, yeah. and, and I think especially as physics teachers, we, we just, we, we, as, as, as Robert said, we, are, we tend to be the, the one teacher in a, a school. It's very difficult. So another, another question that has come up is, um, what about students who perhaps don't do as well in, in this kind of flipped environment? Have you come across that at all? Um, or students who perhaps, I mean, from your video, you set the expectation early on, you give students a schedule, you know, so they should know when they should be reaching certain milestones in your classroom. But you have students who struggle with this. And, and I ask this specifically because of the agency and autonomy that it gives students, but also the tension that might arise if they're not ready for it. So could you say a little bit about that? Okay, so a couple things. First off, before I flipped my classroom, I every year have a couple students that fail. I've made huge changes to my class. It's all this stuff. I still, every year, have a small handful of students that fail. And I don't consider it a failure on my part. It's the reality. I, I try really hard, but in the end, I cannot do the work. As far as students that struggle, how do I help them? And honestly, the best thing is just the one-on-one -on -one time. And uh, we're actually at the point in the school year right now where I'm doing a lot more of helping students schedule their time. So when it comes to, we talk about the stress associated with the, with the agency and the autonomy that they have. So yes, it is stressful, but the truth is this is a skill that they need to be able to organize their lives, to be able to look at, okay, I have all of this work to do. I have a semester to do it in. How am I going to get it done in the reality that is my life? So right now I'm spending more time with students going through and saying, okay, this is where you are. 
this is what is left. These are the days of school we have left. Let's plan out when you are planning to get everything done. Uh, and this is actually the most effective way I have found recently is I, I hand out a, a sheet of paper which lists all of the levels in the class, the dates that I anticipate that like I predicted they should be done. And then they write down when they are done and when they predict they're going to be done. Uh, the other thing that I have found for students that gives them uh, agency and, and helps them determine what they're gonna do and when is you can literally go to the website that I made for the class that lists every assignment. You can go command A to select everything and go into a Word document and press command V and paste everything. And I have students that do that and then they go in and they cross off stuff as they get it done and they put down their schedule. So really, to me, the best way to help students who are stressed about this is to just to help them organize and put it together a plan for how they're gonna get it done. Excellent, and being mindful of time, we have time for maybe a couple more questions. So um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And right now I see that Kyle uh, has a question. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh First of all, uh, thank you for all of your videos. I started assigning them last year and they've been incredibly helpful. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. I'm still early in my career. I'm in year four now, so I'm not really set in my ways. I'm still just trying something completely different every year. And the way you had your classroom set up is very intriguing, obviously very different. Uh, so I had a couple of questions about that. So first of all, there are a lot of different aspects to how your classroom is set up. You have the, the flipped aspect, obviously, the gamified aspect, asynchronous. Uh, it seems like that would be quite an undertaking to set that up. So would you uh, recommend trying to implement these things in stages rather than all at once? And if so, what order would you go in? And I guess my other question is, um, you talked a bit about your class makeup and uh, where I teach AP Physics 1 students are actually mostly sophomores. So I was wondering if like how you, if you feel like there would be any concerns with implementing some of these ideas with younger, maybe not as mature students. Okay. Um, so let me think. It's tough because I, I do feel like all of the concepts, asynchronous slip, gameful mastery, learning, they, they all kind of fit together. Like if you try to take out the asynchronous, then the mastery becomes difficult because like you have a student who then didn't pass the quiz and they, it's going to take them time to be able to, um, you know, make up that, that work. Uh, the gameful, shoot, I, I really, to be honest, I have a hard time saying that taking any piece out of that besides the flipped. I think that the flipped is, is really the best place to start. And then um, I, I, don't, I don't see being able to separate the asynchronous and uh, flipped gameful mastery learning. Um, as far as do I feel like sophomores are ready? I, I think my answer to that is yes. I think the difference is that it's going to take more, um, I, I don't want to use the term handholding, but that's a, the thing that's coming to my head. Uh, like just more guidance. I, I, I feel like more, more check-ins, more, um, more making sure that everybody's on, on the, the uh, doing fine. But I do think that this is a skill that, uh, that everybody really does, does need to be able to organize their lives. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're pressed on. So I I have a very strong feeling about that uh, question. Um, when I was in, and this was the United States until 1950 something, I I, I learned. Uh, we started taking physics in Europe at sixth grade, and we took physics from sixth grade to eleventh grade, which was the final grade. And this allowed instead of one year of very intensive physics, the number of hours are the same. Uh, we we looked into that two years ago. The number of hours are the same, but they're spread over m multiple years. 
And that allows very young people to actually slowly get into physics, chemistry, biology, and it's all in parallel. Rather than having one year intensive biology, one year intensive chemistry, one year intensive physics, I think it's, I mean, I don't know if this is going ever to change again, but it's, it's the issue actually with age and, and, and getting into sciences. I and actually think about that. So I, I agree with you. I think this is a, a serious issue. I mean, uh, one of the, because of what I do, I have conversations with people about their experiences with physics all the time. And the number of people that I run into who have never taken a physics class is tremendous. And, and like, they don't, they don't know what, even what it is. Uh, and it is a serious problem, I think. I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I really wish that there were more physics weaved into um, the curriculum throughout, yeah, the whole time. All right, so unfortunately, uh, we have just about a minute left. Um, my question or something that I would like to conclude with is um, a question for you, Jonathan, what did we miss? What should, have, what should we have asked? What's something that, you know, parting thoughts that you'd like to leave this, this engaged group with? Uh, so I, I just, I, I'm excited by all the different thoughts and ideas that are going through. I, I think it's awesome. I really wish we had just more time in general to do what we need to do and more money to fund it. Um, and I, and I think it, I, I'm amazed that we're still in the middle of a pandemic and we've got all these people that are still trying to figure out how to do this better. And I just, I just think it's awesome. Uh, I'd like, I said it in my video where like for 10 years of my physics teaching, I just taught the way that I was taught. That's it. Right. I, I didn't really think about how I could do this better. Uh, and I think it's really awesome that we are at a place where people, physics teachers, teachers in general are saying, okay, how can I do this better? How can I better serve the, the needs of my students? And I think that's something that you really need to think about as your teacher, because like the way that I run my class isn't necessarily going to work for you because your students are different than my students. Um, and honestly, I just walk away from this really excited for where we're headed. That's it. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your energy and excitement with us today. I mean, it's really contagious. It's really great. And, and I would like to leave this conversation by emphasizing what you said about how can we best serve our students? Um, I think that's really great. And one of the things that really is highlighted uh, within this group and all the hard work they're putting into, you know, improving their own pedagogy. So thank you so much for being a part of that today. We're, we're really excited uh, that we were able to have this conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This was so much fun. Really. Thank you. All right. So we do have a few announcements to make about um, what is coming up before I let you go almost there. So first is um, please follow us on Twitter at PulseTNet. Um, we have gone ahead and started following some of you. So that's just another way for us to stay engaged in addition to our Slack channel. Um, we're always looking for suggestions from you to tell us what speakers and topics you would like to see. Uh, we owe the success in bringing amazing speakers like Jonathan, thanks to you and your feedback. And um, our next uh, Q&A is going to be in January. So we're taking a break for December, uh, but in January, we're going to have uh, Ted Dintersmith join us. Um, so that concludes our time today. Thank you all so much for your questions questions. And again, thank you, Jonathan. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you. Bye.